Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever and whenever you are watching this panel discussion about the blockbuster Israeli documentary, Blue Box, the presentation of the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival. My name is Jan Jabin Elon. I hold citizenship in both the United States and Israel and have known of the Jewish National Fund's Blue Boxes, the subject of this movie's title, for as long as I can remember. And I can't begin to count the number of trees I have bought and dedicated to family and friends through the forestation efforts of JNF. So when I watch this film as a member of the film festival's evaluation committee, I knew that this was going to be a must see for the Atlanta Jewish community. Having just viewed this film, you will agree that it raises troubling questions for those of us who grew up as Zionists believing the romantic tale of Jewish pioneers draining swamps and planting agriculture in unused land that eventually became the state of Israel. Fortunately for us, I had a chance to speak with Michal uh, Weitz, the great granddaughter of Yosef Weitz the, and the instigator of this story, as well as Doron Jarasi, editor of the brilliantly crafted film to answer some of those questions for us. First, however, I wanna introduce our guests. Although Michal has produced several acclaimed films, including The Law in These Parts and Five Broken Cameras, both of which I believe the AJFF has screened in previous years, Blue Box is her debut film as a director. The independent production company she founded produced Wall, a winner for the best documentary in the Dhaka Viv Film Festival, in 2017. Along with Michal, Doron studied at the Sam Spiegel Film and Television School in Israel. He has worked on documentary films and series for all the major documentary channels in Israel and recently edited two projects for American television, a sports documentary film called Dirty Tricks and a crime series called Buried, both for Showtime. I have a lot of questions for these guests, but I wanna start off by clarifying the distinction between JNF USA and JNF KKL in Israel. According to the CEO of JNF USA, Russell Robinson, his organization has been a separate entity since it was incorporated in the US in 1926. And for the last 20 years, JNF USA has been separate from the Israeli organization, even as far as donor dollars. This difference is important because Americans still donate to JNF and they may feel conflicted if they read in the Israeli news about some of the activities of the Israeli JNF in the West Bank or in Bedouin villages in the Negev. So Michal, um, I am hoping you can address this question and then we can do delve into the dilemmas uh, that you raise in your film, both historically and within your own family. Thank you. Okay, hi Jen. Uh, thank you, first of all. I'm very happy uh, to virtually be here and screen Blue Box uh, in your amazing festival. Uh, second of all, I have no um, uh, answer for you, I'm sorry. Uh, the JMF is a private organization and uh, I don't really, it's very difficult to know what is going on inside the organization. It's not transparent. Uh, and I think we all know that. Uh, but yes, there is a, some kind of a separation between uh, JNF USA to JNF Israel. Um, but uh, I think sometimes it's very easy to call it uh, one organization, for example, when uh, when their organization is asking donations for planting trees in Israel, so it looked it looks like the same organization. Uh, but when JNF USA feels uncomfortable to uh, with what uh, JNF Israel uh, is doing, so it's not the same organization. So I don't have a clear answer for for it, but maybe. Uh, that's a very good opportunity to, to, to demand from the organization uh, a clear answer about it. 
Okay, so tell me why you started researching your great grandfather's story in the first place. And, and did you have any idea how that research would impact both you and your family? Well, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, well, uh, it all began in 2007, 14, 15 years ago. Wow, it's, I, I used to say 14, but it's now 15 years ago. Uh, when uh, Facebook uh, 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 came into our world and uh, I just uh, sitting uh, in my home uh, going over uh, uh, Facebook and I saw one day a Two pictures of David Ben Gurion and uh, Joseph White, and somebody wrote in the comments underneath, uh, "War criminals." Uh, ah, yeah, that was my reaction. <laughs> it was like this, uh, and I was completely shocked because this has nothing to do what uh, to what I grew up on. And then for me, my great grandfather is a hero. And actually, David Ben Gurion is also a hero. So uh, it was, uh, I was pretty shocked. And uh, I, 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 I told myself that I had, I have to find the answers. And, and it was really a big gap between everything I grew up on and this nickname. So I started to uh, ask questions, not my family. I was kind of afraid to ask my family, uh, but uh, I went to meet some uh, two historians in Israel uh, and I started to read the diary. And uh, one step out of time, I, 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 I started to understand that well, they weren't war criminals, but uh, the nickname, uh, the architect of transfer is, has something in it. And I opened the diary on 1948 and I started to read and the word transfer popped out from everywhere in the diary. So I understand that something must be right. And then uh, I, I, I learned in Sam Spiegel uh, film school that year, and we had an assignment to, to write a proposal for a documentary. So one plus one uh, became two, and I started working on, the, on, on this documentary, uh, not knowing what is going to be and that it's going to take me 14 years to do it. And it was only uh, three years before I finished the film that I understood that I had to, I have to talk with my family members. Uh, I didn't want to do it. Uh, I was afraid of their, their reactions and uh, I didn't want to annoy anyone or to be the black sheep of, of the family. But it came to a point that I understood that I, ha I cannot do this film without talking with them. And you can see the results on the screen. It wasn't uh, easy for me to do, but I have to say that now everyone is really supportive of the film, including my father. Uh, and my conclusion is even if it's hard and it's not pleasant, you have to talk about the... Uh, the painful issues. Uh, and I thought that they won't be able to listen and to create a discussion about it. But I was kind of surprised that it wasn't easy, but we managed to, to pass the difficulties and we talked about it. And today we can talk about this sensitive topic in very open, openly way. And um, I'm very happy for it. And they like the movie? Yeah, very much. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Good. Um, so I guess in hindsight, did you ever stop and think um, if you should have left yourself in your childhood dreams rather than um, doing this research and learning some of these truths? There were some difficult mo moments uh, along the way. And I remember thinking to myself, 
what the hell am I doing? Uh, and, you know, when my friends went out and go, went to the beach or to drink or something like that, I sat uh, uh, in front of the computer reading uh, uh, things about forestation and uh, lands in Palestine and uh, boring stuff about uh, the Jewish National Fund purchasing lands in Israel. Uh, so I knew that I, I, I'm, I'm dealing with a very sensitive topic and I, I knew that uh, there were, there will be people that won't like it. And, uh, uh, but uh, all along the way, I felt that it's important. It's important, not just because it's, it's something that happened in our history. It, it is our future. Um, and it's important. And if the older generation cannot talk about this, so uh, the responsibility to talk about it, it's on me, it's on my generation. Um, so I felt I'm doing something important. And I have to say this, since the, the, the film uh, launched, I, I think that I can say that we, we, I'm experiencing a very open discussion with people, not only with my generation, uh, mostly with the generation of my parents. And um, it's like they, they knew all the time that the, there is this Pandora box and they didn't want to talk about it. And now they don't like the fact that I'm raising this subject up, but, but they, they are willing to talk about it. So this is my biggest surprise. Um, the film is not a one-dimensional historical film. Uh, you include the personal side of your great-grandfather and the loss of his son. Um, why was that important to the story? Um, well, Ron, maybe you, you can help me here. But uh, first of all, uh, Joseph White's character is very uh, complicated. And it's not. it was important for us to show that... Uh, um, he was a multi-layered person. Uh, he was very sensitive. Uh, he had some uh, uh, moral, morality questions inside him. Uh, so he, he was not only uh, good or not only bad, or it, it, it's a complex of everything. And for us showing that um, uh, Yechiam, his younger, youngest son died, uh, means a lot because, uh, first of all, he sacrificed his son uh, and he did some big... Uh, sacrificing his son, it's, it's, a, it's a big thing. And so he, he didn't only uh, uh, send young people to, 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 to the battle, uh, he also sacrificed his son. And I think that something changed in him after the, the, the death of, of Yechiam. Uh, he, I, I cannot put my finger exactly uh, about, uh, about but what, but we think that it was a bit of um, feeling of revenge. Uh, and, uh, and something that I, he could never, um, be the same man again after it. And I can surely understand it. Uh, but uh, I, I can see um, reading the diary that he became uh, sad and depressed until his dying day, actually. Mm -hmm. But I think there was a sense of revenge after uh, Yechiam's death. So it, in a way, it's part of his motivation, of the character's motivation to, to become more, uh, more dedicated to the cause, I think. And there's a really, a really beautiful scene, which I really love, and it's so tragic, is it's when Israel is celebrating its Independence Day. It's its, its first Independence Day, it's the, the, when, when they win the Independence War. He is so unable to participate in this celebration because he's just in mourning, uh, and it, for me, it makes his. It really adds depth to the character, and it really 
I think, sharpens his motivation to keep on with the cause. And it has a slight, I don't know, revenge is a strong word. I think it's not, it's not as revenge, but, uh, but I think it definitely, um, you can see how the character becomes even more dedicated, I think, to, um, to buying the land, to, be, to building the country, to um, just, he sacrificed the ultimate sacrifice. So as Michal said, and so he's he's all in. <laughs> he's, there's no um, no going and, back. No, but, yeah, exactly. It's yeah. very hard to critic a man that uh, that sacrifices his son. Yeah, right. Joan, um, I thought that the techniques you used in this film were very artful and instructive, uh, such as um, when you put the 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 years and how many Arabs there were versus how many Jews there were in each of those years. Um, why did you feel that was important to add? Just for the context, just for, just for people understanding the context and seeing, I think it's, it demonstrates in such a visual way how the, the demographic changed before the war and after the war, how the, the Jewish country kind of expanded through the land and, and it gives you a sense of orientation you know where you are versus in the, in the story where you are in the in the years you know you have to have it you have to have like this uh, orientation in the story and 48 is such a it, it, what it, there's a, one sort of action before the 48 for the character and after so it's such a midpoint in the in the, in the story so you have to understand how it changed before and after. So Blue Box was obviously very personal for Michal. What was your personal involvement? How did you feel as you were making this film? So as, as I say all the time about the film, it's like it really opened my eyes in so many ways. And in the very basic way of, you know, traveling Israel and just seeing the, the sceneries and, and going through the parts and just just being outside and, and suddenly when Michal speaks about it in the film where, you know, every kind of rock here is, is it might be an, an Arab village from 48. And suddenly I actually started to see these monuments <laughs> hidden in the nature, hidden inside the forest and thinking about the, the whole, she called, she called it in the voiceover, like the trees are like the soldiers that are hiding this kind of past. And, and it really changed the way I looked on the view. And I hoped it would do the same for the audience in a way, just to start noticing because when you grow up here, there's so many layers of history in Israel. You know, you, you never know, is this from a Hordus time or is this a Napoleon time? You don't know where, all well, because you're not an expert, but you know, is this, is this a Roman time? And, and most of the time, it's like you see ruins of villages from 48 and it's, and it's, it's really a stab in the heart just to realize that, you know? Yeah, I caught that in the film. That really stuck out to me because, of course, you see them as you're driving up the highways and everything. But, but you just ignore them generally. It's just pretty. All this history of Israel. The history. <laughs> <laughs> so for both of you, actually, um, I'm wondering, what was your goal? What did you hope to achieve with this film? You know, when I screened the, uh, the film, um, um, now with the corona, I get the chance to screen it in Israel and also be there. Uh, uh, um, but I can see the reactions from the audience. And uh, I think that for me, it was very important to, uh, to tell the history, uh, not in a history lesson way, but... Uh, uh, to tell the history, um, the different history, the history that we are not learning in school, uh, because none of the uh, uh, things that shown in the film are not we are not learning about the Palestinian history in school, and I think that's 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 insane, that's crazy, because it's not something that happened two thousand years ago, uh, it happened seventy years ago, uh, and as I said before, it's part of our present and our future. So I, until today, I cannot understand why Israel is so scared to open this subject uh, and to talk about it. Toron, do you have an answer for that? 
why you think that the, the Palestinian side is not taught in the Israeli schools? They're, it's totally intimidating just to face just to face the other narrative and just to realize there's there's the flip coin for this whole story and just to acknowledge it. And that's what Israel needs to do, you know, for me. Just first of all, just acknowledge, just acknowledge the, the other side, the story, the the history, the pain, the everything that they went went through. It's such like a mirror picture for us. And for me, it's we'll never live in peace in Israel unless we start acknowledging how the how the Palestinians saw these the the history of this of this the, the past seventy years of this place and uh, so it's elementary I think but somehow it's so intimidating and it's so uh, people are just petrified to talk about it and that's what's so wonderful about the film as well when I saw first time the interviews Michal did with it's like it, first of all there most of the people in her family that are interviewed in the film they're an older generation. And it's and she's like standing there confronting them in such a brave way and just speaking her mind. And that's what I thought was so powerful in the interviews. And these are not, you know, these one is an historian, the other one is a journalist. These are, you know, uh, serious people. And she's holding her ground and she's like confronting the, the whole uh, history of this place. And it felt to me like I'm talking to my parents. Because it's the same, it's the same opinions, it's the same views. You know, every every army started a war against us. It's the whole, it's the same rationalizations that you hear, and we are this generation that can say, okay, we understand it's complex, and we can't judge what happened then from the point of view of now, because it's not, it's not fair to judge. I think, but but it is, it is this film should start a dialogue and opening our ears and just trying to acknowledge the other side. To add one more thing, I think it's, it's what you tried to say in the film that it's not their narrative or our narrative. Both narrative are, uh, we ha have their room and space to, to, to talk about and we are right and they're right, we are wrong and they're wrong. And we, we need to, to, uh, uh, to learn uh, those two narratives and respect uh, those two narratives. And what has been reaction in those audiences that you've seen in Israel, I mean, the Israeli audiences, how have they responded to the film? Um, well, actually, uh, as I said before, I was uh, kind of uh, surprised in a good way uh, because I was uh, a bit afraid that the older generation, uh, uh, you know, will do a, I don't want to, to look at it or hear or talk or nothing. And I was surprised that they, uh, they, they we, I had uh, an amazing conversation with the audience, uh, audiences after screenings. Uh, in some places, uh, it was a bit more difficult. People told me uh, 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 those uh, uh, same uh, um, excuses like uh, uh, they started the war, it's their fault. Uh, we went through the Holocaust uh, and things like that. And, and it was very hard to open a, um, um, an authentic discussion uh, after you know, when, when you hear those uh, uh, sentences. But uh, uh, in most of the screenings, uh, I, I got a really good feedback. And I have to say that also from the younger generation, uh, for them, it was a piece of history that they had no idea. And they told me that now they are traveling the country and finally they, they, they can see, they can see the history and, and, and it made them feel a bit stupid because uh, they are now, let's say, 20, and they're here 20 years, and they had no idea where, where about the landscape, about the history. Uh, so uh, I got a very good reactions from the younger generation also. And the, the third kind of audience that um, I was very happy to screen the film to was the uh, 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 Jewish people outside of Israel. I didn't know uh, what kind of uh, 
uh, uh, reaction I will get uh, from those people who are donating for the Jewish National Fund more than the Israelis, because in Israel we were not doing it. But I, the the responses were great until now, and I think it's not necessarily uh, um, it means that tomorrow uh, they are going to stop donating money to the Jewish National Fund, but. They did. A lot of people told me that they are going to ask more questions now, and I want to know uh, where is my money going to, and uh, and and to find out. Not just putting the money in the box or clicking uh, uh, in the web uh, to ask questions about this organization and about the path that the money is doing. Yeah, the, the pandemic has allowed us to bring you here to Atlanta to have this discussion. Unfortunately for you, you're not seeing our audience's reaction, but um, such as life nowadays. And I just want to thank you so much for, number one, doing this film. It was very brave of both of you. Um, and it's a wonderful film. And um, I thank our audience very much for for signing up for this, t- for this movie and for watching us uh, discuss it. Hope it answers some of your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.